Dr. Hematology, King Saud University Fellowship, Associate Professor, Consultant Hematologist, and Head of Hematology Unit in King Khalid University Hospital. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه. I think still some people are sleeping up to now. I hope they will join later. Uh, my lecture today is uh, it's a very big subject, diagnosis of bleeding disorder. What I will concentrate mainly on the laboratory aspect, and uh, I might mention a little bit about clinical or treatment, but I mostly speak about diagnostic procedure or laboratory procedures. Uh, as you know, this is the cascade hemostasis uh, theory. For a long time, it is well known with some modification in the last 20 years. But it is the same as before. Uh, you know, after injury, there will be activation of platelet, as you can see here. It will not show the pointer. Yeah, activation of platelet. At the same time, there is activation of coagulation system and release material from the platelet. One of them is called serotonin, will cause vasoconstriction to allow the clot to build built on. Now, uh, the platelet aggregation release also uh, some phospholipid and the phospholipid is required to complete the coagulation process. In the end, you will get fibrin from the coagulation platelet, and here you will get primary hemostatic blood, and then the platelet fuse together, strengthened by the fibrin threads between them to make it a strong blood. And uh, reduced blood flow will help not to remove the platelet blood. So in the end you will get uh, the hemostatic blood. This is very easy procedure, as you can see, but it is very complicated at the same time. This is working? Yeah. Here. Yeah, very good. Okay, fine. Now, uh, <coughs> the blood vessel wall has a contribution to this. Uh, you know, all blood vessels are lined by endothelial cells. You can see here, this is the lining endothelium. In all big arteries, medium-sized arteries, small arteries, veins, venules, you can see the endothelial lining, even the capillaries. You know, the capillaries are mostly endothelium, then basement membrane, and then no more, very uh, thin layer. Uh, there are uh, elastic tissue, muscular tissue, and the collagen, which is important for us here, is immediately under, sub -endoth under the endothelium. That's why we call it subendothelial collagen, which is very important for activation of platelet. Now, there are blood vessel diseases in the tissues, in the collagen itself, and these are enumerated here. As you can see, one of them is hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. These are all rare conditions. The other one is called caspic merit syndrome or hemangioma with thrombocytopenia because when there is hemangioma, is a, a network of blood vessels which attract the platelet and the trap the platelet, so the patient will have thrombocytopenia as well. Uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and 
pseudoxanthoma elasticum, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, is a disease in the collagen quality. And here, pseudoxanthoma elasticum is precipitation of lipid in the collagen. And homocysteine urea, as you know, homocysteine will be deposited under the, uh, in the blood vessel wall, destroy it. And Marfan syndrome, this is congenital hemocysteine urea, but there is also acquired hemocysteine urea due to foliate and B12 deficiency. Marfan syndrome, which is deficiency of the elastic tissue and collagen in the body, and usually associated with dissecting aneurysm of the aorta, which can be fatal. Osteogenesis imperfecta is abnormal formation of bones. As you know, the bones is formed from collagen and deposition of calcium and phosphorus. So if the collagen is abnormal, you will get abnormal formation of bones. This is a patient from here. He was a medical student about 15 years ago, and he got Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. You can see bleeding sub, uh, subcutaneously, sometimes severe bleeding, also epistaxis and bleeding from the mouth, from the teeth, and so on. Uh, this is hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, again abnormality in the blood vessel wall, and you could see multiple plebs in the mucous membrane and the skin. These plebs become worse when the patient becomes older, and they bleed, rupture and bleed, and they might cause severe iron deficiency anemia. Now, acquired blood vessel diseases, are allergic purpura, most common, enoxone line purpura, and this is anti IgA immune complex deposition in the blood vessel, and paraproteinemia, as you see in myeloma, Waldenstrom, and so on. Senile purpura, when the person become old, uh, will lose the connective tissue and collagen, so the skin become crumbled like this and the capillaries become very weak too, and they become fragile. So any uh, pressure on the skin or trauma on the skin will cause bleeding. A drug induced, the most commonly is steroid, sulfonamides, iodides, aspirin, digoxin, so many drugs, you know, methyl dopa, estrogen, uh, allopurinol, pen even penicillin, and other antibiotic can cause this. Vitamin C deficiency is important. Vitamin C is very important for the integrity of collagen and the platelet. So when you got deficiency, you will get a scurvy, uh, and it is perifollicular bleeding in the skin, and also from the mucous membrane. Porpora simplex, easy bruising. It occurs usually in young women. Psychogenic purpura is inflected by themselves and purpura associated with infection. A lot of infections, meningococci, other bacterial infection, most of the viral infection will can, give you, can give you rash and bleeding under the, under, from the capillaries. This is the vitamin C deficiency. You can see perifollicular petechiae around each follicle, hair follicle or in the skin. This is senile purpura, as you can see. The skin is crumbled, very old age, usually above 80. This will happen, elderly people. And this is, anybody guess? What is this? Have you seen one like this? This is a child. Allergic purpura. It's called Hinox line purpura. Usually, it resolves by itself, but sometimes it will leave some complication, such as renal failure. Now, this is paraproteinemia, and there is bleeding subcutaneously in a patient with myeloma. Now, I will come to the platelet now. As you know, the normal platelet count is 150,000 to 400,000. Uh, the normal lifespan of the platelet is 7 to 10 days. And uh, what is called MPV, the size of the platelet, 
is 7.30 to 11.1. What is uh, some diseases you will get large MPV or high MPV. We mention them, might mention them later. Also, uh, the diameter of the platelet is 1 to 2.5 micron. When it is above 2.5 micron, we call it macro from both sides. And as you know, the platelet is formed by segmentation from the cytoplasm of the megakaryocyte. This is a megakaryocyte, the largest cell in the bone marrow. And here you can see uh, granulation of the cytoplasm, mature, mature megakaryocyte, and the platelet just come off from the border of the cytoplasm. In fact, recent theory said that the megakaryocytes are embedded in the sinusoid of the bone marrow, so the platelet come directly in the bloodstream. Uh, this is a blood film not of a normal person, as you see, but I just want to show you the sizes of platelet. Some of them are very large, like this. This is a normal size, medium size, normal size, and so on. This is a patient with essential thrombocythemia, actually. Uh, the platelet uh, structure is usually uh, discoid or oval in shape, and it contains two types of granules, the, uh, what is called the dense body granules and the alpha granules. This is the alpha granules, this is dense body granules, that is show dark under the electron microscopy. This is a, a system or what is called uh, a tubular system, dense tubular system, to hold the structure of the platelet and keep it in this shape. And here is what is called peripheral microtubules, which actually squeeze the platelet during activation. Uh, and we have what is called open membrane system. This invagination usually filled with coagulation phospholipid, which attract the coagulation factor when the platelet are activated. There is also mitochondria, and there is lysosomes. Now, the structure of the platelet, again, cross-section, uh, the same finding. However, there is detail about what is called electron-dense granules. Uh, you will have a nucleotide calcium serotonin, you know the function of serotonin, what we say function of serotonin? Cause vasoconstriction in the engine area. And this is the specific alpha granules, which contain many factors, fibrinogen, factor 5, vonulbrand, fibrinoctin, beta thromboglobulin, and heparin antagonist, which is called platelet factor 4, and thr thrombospondin, right? Uh, uh, I can, the same as this is open membrane system and this is the membrane and the open membrane system is called at, in the past is what it called platelet factor 3 okay and this one is platelet factor 4 if you hear of it now the platelet when there is injury exposure of collagen as you see no endothelium here. The vulnerable factor come and become as an intermediate which connects the platelet to the subendothelial collagen. So this is called platelet adhesion to subendothelium. Now when this happens, this will expose glycoprotein 2 B and 3A to act also and glycoprotein 1A to attach directly to the collagen. Doesn't mean this glycoprotein 2 and 3 are vonal brand dependent. I think it should be clear that the vonal brand dependent is glycoprotein 1B. Inside the platelet, there is a, a chemical process called arachidonic acid pathway. In the end, as you can see, this is a phospholipid, lipase, lipase, and then you will get arachidonic acid by enzymes, cyclo, uh, sorry, 
by phospholipase, you will get alkidonic acid. By enzyme cyclooxygenase, you will get endoperoxides, prostaglandins, and another enzyme called thromboxane synthase, you will get thromboxane A2. And thromboxane A2 is a very sticky agent which uh, attracts the platelet to uh, vulnerable factor through the glycoprotein one. Now, in the endothelium lining, always also you get this process. However, in the end, instead of thromboxane synthase, you will get prostacycline synthase. And then, then you get prostacycline, which is repellent to the platelet, antiplatelet. That's why you don't see any arterial thrombosis in a normal child. Why? Because there is very active endothelium. Always you get a layer of prostacycline on the surface of the whole endothelium, which prevents the platelet to stick. When the person becomes older and older, atheroma precipitated, and when destroy the endothelium, the platelet come and attach themselves or adhere to the subendothelial collagen. On the surface of the platelet, it's very important to understand some diseases. You will get what is called glycoproteins. One of them is glycoprotein 1, and this is vulnerable factor which attached itself to glycoprotein 1 on the surface of platelet and to the, sub, to the subendothelial collagen. So this is a bridge between the platelet and subendothelial collagen. Without glycoprotein 1, there is no adhesion. And without von Brand, which is where? In the plasma, you will get no adhesion of the platelet. Also, you got glycoprotein 2 and 3, 2B and 3A, uh, which actually on the surface of the platelet, this is another platelet, bridging them is a fibrinogen. Therefore, without fibrinogen, if you take the platelet from a donor, wash them with saline, they will not aggregate. If you put plasma on, with them, which contain fibrinogen, they can aggregate. So this platelet-platelet interaction or aggregation, you need the fibrinogen. If the fibrinogen low or there is no fibrinogen, what's called a fibrinogenemia, then you will get abnormal platelet function. Also, uh, on the surface of a platelet, you will get receptors for the agonist, and here you will get for active coagulation factors. And there is, as we said, the dense body and alpha granules, if they are deficient, or one of them are deficient, we call it storage pool disease. Again, there will be weak or no aggregation of the platelet. Now, remember deficiency of vulnerable one, uh, vulnerable factor, we call it vulnerable disease. Deficiency of glycoprotein one, we call it Bernard Schiller syndrome. Deficiency of glycoprotein two and three, we call, we call it Glanzmann thromboacenia. And deficiency of or reduction of fibrinogen, we call it afibrinogenemia or hypofibrinogen. I have to speed up. Uh, this is the vulnerable brand factor by composed of three parts, the factor 8 antigen or vulnerable brand antigen, you yeah, call it, factor 8C or clotting activity and vulnerable brand factor, which is receptor uh, glycoprotein 1, B is a receptor for vulnerable brand factor. Without it, there will be no aggregation or adhesion. Now, why we got low factor 8 in vulnerable brand disease? This has nothing to do with, with vulnerable brand disease. Factor 8. Because factor 8, you need a body to carry it. Right? If the vulnerable brand body is absent, then you will get no factor there to be carried. Therefore, it will be destroyed by the endothelial cell. Otherwise, in vulnerable brand disease, actually, the factor eight gene is normal and is forming factor eight, but nothing to carry it. That's why in vulnerable brand you got factor eight C vulnerable brand antigen low, 
and resuscitating cofactor law. Uh, the platelet in a normal state or not activated or what's called static state is discoid and oval in shape. You can see the open membrane system, the arrows. And here when they contract or activate it, they change their shape and they produce like pseudopodia. Right, how we measure the platelet function? You know there are functions for platelet. One of them is adhesion, stickness to the subendothelial collagen, and shape change. They change the shape. Then they secrete their, uh, the, there will be contraction, as we see it by the microtubules, and there will be secretion of their content. So these steps, one followed by another. You will get disease in any of these steps. How do you measure platelet function? Bleeding time first. In the past, bleeding time is used a lot. Uh, and actually, it's a good test. It correlates with the tendency of bleeding in the patient going for surgery or they are suffering from bleeding disorder. So this is called simplet. If there is one knife, one cutting knife, it's called simplet one. If there is two, we call it simplet two. And there is usually trigger, when you press it, put it on the forearm of the patient. Uh, uh, forearm service, front service of the, of the patient, then put this uh, kit and trigger it by pressing here the knobs. And this, uh, you can see the knobs here. All right. Two knives will come out, release very quickly, and do cut in the skin, each one half centimeter in, in length and 0.1 or one millimeter in depth. And this is the standard cut. You allow it to bleed, stopwatch is started, and then you will see how long it bleeds. Maybe one will stop before the other, then you will take the average. Normally, what is the normal bleeding time? Hmm? Below 10. Okay? Nine and a half minutes. But anything below 10, we call it normal. If the bleeding time above 10, we call it abnormal. And this is a procedure which I explained just now. You can see the two cuts here when they stopped. Don't touch. The, of course, the blood will come. You should not touch the edge of the injury. Why? Because if you touch it, you will remove the platelet block. You want the platelet block to build on to stop the bleeding. This is uh, another instrument. It's called PF A100 and uh, AF100. And this is to measure uh, the platelet like bleeding time. Platelet aggregation like bleeding time. So actually this one is replacing bleeding time now. You bring citrated blood, you know the bleeding time is painful to the children, to the women, leave a scar, brown people, they have scar as well. So you aspirate blood, citrated blood, and put it through the aperture of the instrument. There is animation, animation, but it doesn't work, I think. Uh, and uh, this will measure for you from the time of the beginning of blood flow between the two aperture, uh, between two cartridge which contain adrenaline or collagen and then it will induce aggregation until the bleeding time stop uh, until the aggregation full it will stop and give you time in second printing normally is about 110 seconds below 110 seconds right Platelet aggregation is a way which actually uh, rely on it now for evaluation of diseases of platelet. And this is called biodata. And this is, the, as you can see, the paper coming from it which give you traces of aggregation when we put the agonist. We use adrenaline, collagen, ADP, arachidonic acid, sometimes thrombin. 
to uh, uh, measure, uh, we put them on the platelet-rich plasma. Here, what you have to need to know, saturated blood, separated, then you will take centrifuge and separated, then you will take platelet-rich plasma to be used in this instrument. The other instrument, uh, this is the normal tracing, as you can see, uh, for all uh, ADP collagen, this is collagen, and arachidonic acid, adrenaline, and this is for restocetine, different concentration. Now, another instrument which we have in our lab is called multiplate. It's called multiplate because it has multiple electrodes. And this is also very useful. Uh, Sometimes we, we need to do both biodata and multiplate. Also, we have five agonists, the same which I mentioned them, adrenaline, collagen, uh, arachidonic acid, and uh, uh, yeah, adrenaline, collagen, arachidonic acid. Uh, and uh, we put here, in fact, is uh, we don't use uh, platelet-rich plasma. We use here whole blood heparinized with lithium heparin. So you take the blood, add it to saline, equal amount, and leave it for incubation, two minutes or three minutes. Then add the reagent or agonist, for example, arachidonic acid or uh, adrenaline or collagen, and allow it for six minutes, then the reaction will start or the aggregation will start, which will be traced on a paper, computerized, and will be traced a paper like this, right? Now, this is very useful. The first one, which I told you, uh, what is called PF100, and this one, multiplate, are very useful to see if the patient on aspirin or clobidogrel, Plavix, are actually acting, this medication acting on them or not. And in fact, some of the patients don't have, uh, the aspirin will not work on them or clobidogrel. So you have to discover it, otherwise they will have attack of coronary after stenting or coronary bypass or whatever it is. So you can, you can see here the normal uh, aggregation by the slope and quantity. And here, you can see what is called aspirin effect, usually it to work on ASP, which is arachidonic acid-like. And you can see here, very flat, going down. And here are the normal ADP and trap. And you know, sometimes you get aspirin resistant. Completely, there is no response here. And the aspirin resistant, you will be surprised why, many factorial. One of them is that the patient is not compliant. One of the important, which uh, doesn't take the aspirin properly. Or because the aspirin dose is too small and the patient got cyclooxygenase, strong cyclooxygenase or plenty of cyclooxygenase. So this aspirin is not enough to inhibit cyclooxygenase. And sometimes, some patients, they don't absorb aspirin. A clobidogrel, the same thing, you know. Therefore, you have to make sure when you put a patient with coronary bypass or post-stenting, you should measure the platelet function, really, to see is it working or not. Otherwise, you are working blindly. Uh, this is uh, Clobidogrel, or the commercial name Plavix, uh, 75 milligram, and sometimes you give 100 milligram. There are variable tablets the British use 75 milligram, American use 81 milligram, and the German use 100 milligram. The German is the one who manufactured the aspirin originally, 70 years ago or more, I think. So why this variant? I don't know. Why 80 milligram, 81 milligram and not 85 or 100? I couldn't understand. So uh, anyway, if I use aspirin, I am using aspirin, I'm using 100 milligram per day. Right, uh, as you can see, here you got 
depression in the trap and uh, the other ADP and ASPT is normal in clobidogrel. Uh, sorry, here, depression of trap and ADP, but the uh, ASP is uh, ASP and ADP is not working, and the other one is working. And this is clobidogrel non-responsive. Okay. There is another drug called triofibin, which is very expensive drug. It's antibody to glycoprotein 2B and 3A, and it prevents the aggregation of platelets. So if you got somebody resistant to both aspirin and clobidogrel, they will be starting him on this drug, but this drug has to be given intravenously. Sometimes it's be given immediately after stenting or bypass, coronary bypass. The dose is 32 mL per hour. Now, this is a, a normal aggregation control. And this is my platelet. And you can see here the aspirin is making it very flat. 20%, which is very low. I think below 20% might be dangerous of bleeding. So ideally, you should keep it between 32 above 20. And about 32 is good, about 30. More than 40% than is not working properly. Okay, hereditary platelet function is a big list. And uh, the most common is the membrane defect, which is bernard schleier syndrome, Glanzmann's, and platelet factor three deficiency. There is also some cases of storage pool disease of the, uh, these also rare, either alpha granule called gray platelet syndrome or the dense body granules. Sometimes you will get combination of both, which is rare, and sometimes you will get abnormality in the cyclooxygenase enzyme or thromboxin synthetase deficiency or defective response to thromboxin. Miscellaneous like Epstein syndrome and Mayheglin anomaly here, we got giant platelet. This patient are born with nerve deafness, earth nerve deafness, and renal failure and purpura, and they will die most of the time. This is a child that came to us many years ago, two years old, with epistaxis and purpura, we gave him treatment. What do you expect to give platelet uh, deficiency people? Yes. You give them platelet aggregation, a platelet concentrate. So we gave him platelet concentrate for five days and he was okay. However, after five days, still he got purpura and ecomosis in the leg. And we did the platelet aggregation, what you can see here. This is ADP, collagen, arachidonic acid, adrenaline. No aggregation at all, right? This is no aggregation. As you can see, all of them are flat. And this is ristocetin, some aggregation with 0.5, more with 1.5. Now, what is the diagnosis? Hmm? Landsman's thrombosis. Now, this is another patient, again, with epistaxis and bleeding, purpura, and you get aggregation in reverse completely to the other one. Collagen, arachidonic acid, adrenaline are okay, normal, but no aggregation with ristocetin. You see, this is the patient here, and this is the control. There is no aggregation with ristocetin. What is the diagnosis? bernard Schuller syndrome, right? Okay, this is the reaction usually you can see. Here are the bernard Schuller syndrome, and this is Glanzmann's, as you can see, collagen ADP, arachidonic acid, ristocetin. And here is bernard Schuller syndrome, no aggregation with ristocetin. And here is storage pool disease, only primary phase aggregation with ADP, no aggregation with collagen and 
arachidonic acid and aggregation with Risto CT and this is the normal. Okay, causes of acquired platelet dysfunction is these listed, myelofibrosis, acute leukemia and uh, pre-leukemia or MDS, dysfibrinogenemia, uh, dysfib uh, uh, dysproteinemia, chronic hypoglycemia, liver disease, valvular and congenital heart disease, and severe burns, scurvy, and drugs. The most common drug is aspirin. Now, we come to the coagulation. I don't want to spend a lot of time on normal hemostasis, but I will show you some abnormality during uh, my discussion. Then I'll show you a scenario, hopefully in the last 20 minutes. Right, uh, these are the coagulation factors starting from 1 to 13. No factor 6, as you see, factor 5, then 7, and uh, what is called protein C, protein S, antithrombin 3, and these are the high contact factor, uh, uh, high molecular weight kinergine and pre calicrine calicrine, and this is uh, thrombomodulin, and this is tissue factor pathway inhibitors. Uh, all these uh, cause bleeding, except protein C, protein S, antithrombin 3, and factor 12. Will not cause bleeding, right? Why? Factor 12 will not cause bleeding. In fact, it causes thrombosis. I'll show you later. This is the cascade and uh, you can see by activation of uh, after injury there will be release of pre-calicrine, calicrine, high molecular weight calinogen and activate the factor 12 by contact and these and 12A also activate the release of more of these. So it's a vicious circle. Again, 12A, it needs high molecular weight kinergine to activate factor 11. With calcium, 9 will be activated. 9A with calcium and platelet phospholipid will activate 10, and down will activate 2 calcium and phospholipid. Factor 5 is required here, and factor 8 is required here. Now, 2 will become thrombin after activation, it's called 2A. This will act on fibrinogen and it will form fibrin after splitting peptide A and B. When, when thrombin is, uh, is formed, it will activate factor 13. And factor 13, active factor 13, will cause cross-linking of fibrin. Now, in the down in the scale, when thrombin act on fibrinogen, it will split peptide A and B. By this, it will convert fibrinogen from liquid soluble to clot. Just removal of the peptides A and B. And it will become fibrin. So fibrinogen without peptide A and B, after the action of the thrombin, will become fibrin. Now, uh, again, when you see here, it's fibrin aggregates by cross-linking with fibrin, cross-linking off with active 13. It, uh, now the fibrin is soluble, can dissolve, but here it becomes insoluble after cross-linking with factor 13. And the top of the scale, you will see factor 12 has three important functions. One is to activate factor 11. One is to, uh, the second one is to activate fibrinolysis. And the third function, it helps in the uh, inflammation. It's a chemotactic substance. So as you can see, 12A here with the calcrine, uh, it activates intrinsic pathway, but also it will activate plasminogen to become plasmin. This is a natural process. We can do this process of activating plasminogen by giving tissue plasminogen activator or urokinase or streptokinase. 
These are the drug which is used nowadays for treatment of thrombosis, thrombotic plugs to remove the thrombosis, and it will end in a plasmin, act on fibrin, and fibrin, you will get fibrin degradation product. The process of activation of uh, plasminogen, it usually occurs after fibrin formation. This is important to remodeling of the blood vessels and tissues. Otherwise, you will get permanent clots. Now, <clears throat> correlation of coagulation factors. Now, I want to show you this is about hemophilia. I'll show you some clinical picture about it. Hemophilia is uh, a disease deficiency of factor eight clotting activity inherited by deficiency of the gene of factor eight on X chromosome, on the long arm, the long arm of X chromosome. So the female usually are carrier and the males are the diseased or the patient. The severity of the disease can be divided in three types according to the factor eight level. If it is below 1%, we call it severe hemophilia and those they have frequent spontaneous bleed usually in the joints and muscles in the musculoskeletal system as we say now if the percentage is between five one to five we call it moderate disease also it will bleed the patient will bleed post-traumatically but occasionally they will have spontaneous episode mild hemophilia they usually bleed is a mild disease usually bleed after surgery or trauma, but they don't bleed spontaneously. Uh, this is a, one of our patients some years ago, and you can see hemarthrosis or swelling of the joint, the right joint. Here we got hematoma and swelling of the joint, and the other leg has atrophy of the muscles. Again, here you got uh, hemarthrosis of uh, the joint, knee joint, and the muscles. This is crippled, as you can see, multiple joints are affected by hemarthrosis, then contraction happen. This is a severe bleeding after a fall or trauma uh, in hemophiliac patient. Uh, X-ray of the joint showing you fibrosis here and also some fibrosis here. And this is fixed joint at 90 degree with severe fibrosis. The patient cannot use the leg, so the treatment are arthrodesis or uh, artificial joint. Now, summary will help you. This is the intrinsic pathway, 12 down to the 10, and this is the extrinsic pathway, 7, 10. And this is the common pathway from 10 down. So if this will measure PTT, this will measure PT. As you can see here, this is PT, extrinsic pathway, intrinsic pathway, APTT, common pathway from 10, both and will be prolonged. PT and PTT will be prolonged. I don't go through the treatment, just mention here uh, replacement therapy, cryo factor eight, factor nine for Christmas disease, fresh frozen plasma in mild cases sometime. Uh, DDAVP sometime is useful. And uh, treatment of patient with inhibitor is a very big procedure and complicated surgical and orthopedic treatment management of patient with hepatitis B, C, and HIV because those patients are prone to get this due to the infusion with factor eight, especially the human factor eight. Nowadays, they don't give children with hemophilia human factor eight. They give them what? Recombinant factor eight. And uh, these are details about prophylactic, and so I will not discuss it. Now here, the level of factor eight desired for each, uh, each process, for example, in hemoarthrosis, you need 20 to 30 percent, 50 to 100 percent for uh, dental extraction or hema or severe hemarthrosis or internal hemorrhage. And for surgery, you need 70 to 100%. And this is how do you calculate the dose, body weight, 
multiplied by desired percentage rise of factor eight divided by two. And this will give you the dose in units. Right. Treatment of inhibitor, again, combinant, high dose, factor E, recombinant, factor eight, uh, sorry, recombinant factor seven, what's called activated, activated prothrombin complex, FIBA, factor eight, uh, inhibitor, inhibitor bypassing activity is called FIBA, immunosuppression by chemotherapy sometime, and intravenous immunoglobulin, and high dose of factor eight con uh, frequently to depress the antibody level. I'll come to vonal brand, which is more complicated than hemophilia A. Uh, we have type 1, which is mild form of vonal brand, is a quantitative, quantitative deficiency of vonal brand factor. Type 2 is a qualitative, I will explain it later, decreased platelet function in type 2A, uh, and you will get absent time molecular weight multimers or vulnerable brand factor, 2B variant with increased affinity to platelet glycoprotein 1B. That's why the platelet here, on the contrary of the mild one or type one, what will happen if with ristocetine? You will get aggregation, okay? Uh, because they have affinity to 1B, glycoprotein 1B. Uh, 2M as 2A here, high molecular weight multimers of, uh, of uh, vulnerable factor present, uh, but it's not working collectively. Variant with decreased 2N affinity for factor 8, and here virtually complete absence of vulnerable brand factor. So this is the most severe form, type 3 is the most severe form of factor 8. If we go on to a little bit more detail, you can see platelet associated function is decreased in 2A, factor 8 binding capacity is normal, factor 8 uh, vulnerable brand factor will be uh, ne uh, no, Neil, uh, sorry. Uh, factor 2B is increased affinity. Factor 2B is uh, increased affinity to glycoprotein 1. So you'll get factor 8 binding capacity, normal, and high molecular weight vulnerable brand multimers is usually reduced. Factor 2M, decreased platelet function, associated function, and you will have normal factor eight binding capacity and normal uh, ultra large uh, uh, ultra large multimers. Uh, 2N, you get normal platelet function and reduced factor eight binding capacity and normal high molecular weight vulnerable brand multimers. Right. The genetic of von Brandt factor, since the 1980s actually, uh, there is uh, what is called molecular and cellular uh, statistic uh, have defi defined studies or uh, has defined, have defined hemophilia A and von Brandt uh, more precisely. So in vulnerable brand factor, in hemophilia A, as we know, we said factor A gene is deficient on the long arm of X chromosome. But uh, you got the gene for vulnerable brand factor on chromosome 12. And there will be absence of this gene on chromosome 12 uh, short arm, as you can see, uh, 12B. Uh, also, uh, you will get uh, 20 uh, uh, exons, 52 exons, and it's very long KLU base of the uh, 178 KLU base uh, with 52 exon and intron 
uh, boundaries tend to be different structurally domain and the protein. Okay, so uh, that's the structure of the von Willebrand gene reflects the mosaic nature of the protein. All right. Uh, uh, treatment of vulnerable brand similar to the hemophilia. You will get local measures, antifibrinolytic agent, tranexamic acid, and uh, to stop fibrinolysis, DDAVP in mild cases, and high purity factor 8, vulnerable brand factor, concentrate for patients with very low vulnerable brand level, and factor 8, concentrate may also be given for more rapid correction. Uh, <clears throat> there is what is called acquired von Willebrand disease you might come across. Uh, how this actually syndrome uh, diagnosed? By the way, the acquired von Willebrand syndrome, they call it, is multi-clinical uh, and uh, laboratory features. Uh, but the disease itself, the genetic disease, inherited, is called von Willebrand disease. Here we call it von acquired von Willebrand syndrome, right? Uh, what are the markers we know of and what I say are important in uh, acquired von Willebrand syndrome? There are actually, uh, the causes are so many, mostly autoimmune disease, uh, lymphoproliferative disorder, hypothyroidism, myelofibrosis, Wilms tumor, uh, angiodysplasia, mesangimal dysplasia, renal failure, uh, rare congenital syndrome, uh, tumor syndrome, uh, uh, tumor syndrome, uh, what is called uh, lactoferrin deficiency, hemoglobin E, beta thalassemia, viral and parasitic infection, also seen in patient receiving therapy with antibiotic and anticonvulsant and plasma uh, expenditure. So there are so much variety which can produce acquired von Willebrand disease. Uh, the aim of therapy in patients with von Willebrand disease von Willebrand syndrome, sorry, is what options are available and what to do. We know if they are efficient or not. Uh, the aim is of the therapy in patient is to uh, control or prevent bleeding when it occurs and eradicate the inhibitors because here what we have is inhibitor antibodies to von Willebrand factors which is precipitated by the diseases, so many diseases which I mentioned earlier. So how do you eradicate the, eradicate the inhibitor when present? Treat the underlying cause. For example, if it occurs in myeloma or lymphoma or other conditions, you have to treat the original disease. Now, therapeutic options is controlling of bleeding, dysmopressine sometime, tranexamic acid, Factor 8, von Willebrand, factor concentrate, and recombinant factor 7 activated. Uh, Sometimes we give intravenous immunoglobulin, immunosuppressive agent, suppressive agent, and corticosteroid, plasma exchange, sometimes is useful, and immunoadsorption to remove the antibody. Uh, treatment of underlying disorder such as chemotherapy, treat the disease itself, if it is cancer or lymphoma, and radiotherapy, and sometimes surgery. If the patient got hypothyroidism, you have to give him thyroxine and other treatment. Right. Now, uh, I should mention one factor. Uh, I don't know why the slide came late here. Uh, this is a Saudi boy with, uh, with uh, keloid formation. 
and he developed bleeding, so he was transferred to our hospital. We did all the factors, PT, PTT was, were normal, and fibrinogen normal, we did factor assays, it's all normal, and we thought this is, might be factor 13 deficiency, so we did five molar urea tests. As you can see here, adding urea to the clot, concentrated urea to the clot, if the patient has no factor 13, the urea will dissolve the clot, cause lysis. After 24 hours, there will be complete lysis. It depends on the extent of the deficiency of factor 13. And you can see here, after 24 hours, it's completely dissolved. Now, I put the diagnostic scenario. How long do we have time? Five minutes. Hmm? Five minutes. No, no, we started 15 minutes late. You remember? We can have time from lunch, extended lunch. Yeah, I think we started 15 minutes late. Right. <clears throat> the dentist referred to you, a 16 years old boy who was diagnosed previously as hemophiliac. He is requiring tooth extraction. You are provided with factor 8 assay result and graph papers. So you have to calculate for me factor assay and answer these questions. What is factor 8? How would be you investigate the patient for the presence of inhibitor? You are provided with a graph paper and so on. How do you manage this patient? What are the advice? We don't we need to, un to get all the answers. We already spoke about some of them, but this is the graph paper, uh, double logarithmic paper, and the result of the standard or reference plasma, you can see here, one in 10, give you 60 seconds, one in 20 is, uh, one in 20 is 67, 67, one in 40 is 74, and one in 80 is uh, 81 seconds. And the patient, one in 10, 155 seconds, and one in 20, 115. When you go dilution, you should get low, lower than the first point, right? One in 10, it should be 100% factor eight. So why here we get one in 40, one in 20, Shorter time than one in ten. What do you think he got the patient? He got factor eight inhibitor, right? So you draw a line here, this is the standard, and this is the first point about the patient. So you can see they don't meet at all. They are not parallel. They are not parallel. And so the patient line goes below 1%. You can see this is 1.5%, this is 0%. So it is below 1%. Uh, this means that no factor left is, is left in this patient, uh, which is indicating presence of inhibitor. What you will do here, you will uh, do the dilution of inhibitor, and do residual factor 8 assay. So you can see the control plasma is uh, for factor 8 is uh, uh, factor 8 for the control is 1116, 115%. 1, All right. And for the patient concentration, concentrated plasma is 0%. Then you will go another dilution, 1 in 10 is 0%, 1 in 20 is 1%, 1 in 40, 3%, 1 in 80, 22%, 1 in 150, uh, sorry, 1 in 160, 43%, and 1 in 320 is 54%, 1 in 640, very high dilution, is 61%. So the higher the dilution, the more residual factor 8 in the uh, left. 
Now, which dilution you will take to do the graph? Which one? Because the nearer to 50%. 50% residual factor 8 is equivalent to one Bethesda unit. All right? So what is the nearer to the factor 8, uh, to uh, uh, one unit? Is the dilution 10320, which is 54%. So we put this as a, sorry on the graph as you can see here uh, you got 54 if you blot it until it meets the line here all right so here this is 54 percent goes down to the line of the graph and then go down to get the percentage of factor it in fact it is 0.9 percent Bethesda unit per mil. But this is not the final result. So you have to multiply it by the dilution. The dilution is 320. So the final result will be, as you can see here, 0.9 by multiplied by 320, it will be 288 Bethesda unit per mil. I think you know now how you do the find the factor 8 level. Now, this is a four years old gear is investigated for epistaxis, persistent epistaxis. You can see PT, APTT, 23 seconds, fibrinogene is 2.9 gram, and the normal is 2, 2 to 4, and platelet is 45,000 only. What is your prerequisite? when you receive a request for platelet aggregation. What are the tests you should done before you do platelet aggregation? Hmm? You cannot accept anyone saying you platelet aggregation, right? First, there is a history of bleeding, should be. And then you have to get the platelet count, platelet count, and the coagulation screening, PT, PTT, fibrinogen. So if the platelet count is very low, you will get abnormal aggregation. If the fibrinogen is very low, you will get uh, also abnormal aggregation. There is no point to do the test if these parameters are low. You have to get these before you do platelet aggregation. Now we have the platelet here, 45. What is the next step you will do? The coagulation is okay, normal. But uh, the platelet count is low. What do you need to see? You need to see blood film, right? You can have a platelet clamping. These are actually clamping platelet in the film. You want to see are they genuinely, genuine low platelets. You might do manual count as well. So we will see the blood film. What is this? What is the most likely diagnosis? I can't hear. <laughs> Sorry. Can you see this platelet? Very large platelet. Giant platelet. What are the conditions you see giant platelet with them? Well, married under bleeding tendency. Married under epistaxis all the time, recurrent. So this is most likely Bernard Siller syndrome. You will get large, giant, abnormal platelet and thrombocytopenia. And then you do the aggregation. And you see here... Uh, Ristocetine with different concentration, 0.5 and 1.5, is completely flat. Can you see the red one? And the top is flat. The other aggregating agent are normal. So this confirms, this is what? Bernard-Schiller syndrome. 
What additional tests you might request? To confirm it, 100%. You have to do flow cytometry, right? For glycoprotein 1B, to confirm. Uh, this is the bernard Celler syndrome. Okay, there is another scenario. Uh, 52 years old woman with bleeding tendency, her CBC as shown below, uh, it's not here, uh, I'm missing it, but I will tell you, the hemoglobin is 7.2 gram, the white cell is 2, uh, 10.5, and the platelet count 107. So there is thrombocytopenia, right? But the thrombocytopenia, is it enough, this 107, to cause this abnormality? of the aggregation. You can see here, all of them are very low percentage aggregation. Actually, in fact, this patient, uh, also we did the multiplet and shows low aggregation. And this is the coagulation screening. You remember we said, we don't accept platelet count if the coagulation is abnormal. So this is the coagulation here, PT45, APTT89, fibrinogen 1.17, and platelet 1.2. All right? The thrombocytopenia is not enough to cause all these aggregation abnormalities. So this is hypofibrinogenemia, which uh, actually gave you this abnormal aggregation. Now, this is a uh, tracing uh, of platelet aggregation. Again, it shows that flat aggregation, but not with restocytine. Most likely what? Glansman's, right? And this is, uh, again, uh, no aggregation with Ristocetine, but aggregation with the others, most likely bernard Celler syndrome. There is a lot of explanation I put on the, about bernard Celler syndrome, and uh, we don't have time to discuss it, but the most important is how do you differentiate from, from von Willebrand disease? Okay? So what you will do to differentiate from von Willebrand disease? Hmm? You have to assay factor A, von Brand factor, and factor von Brand antigen. Uh, what is this you expect? A platelet aggregation from a patient with a bleeding tendency? Ristocetine is normal. There's abnormality in ADP and the adrenaline collagen. What that comes to your mind? This is storage pool disease, right? And as you can see here, this is... Uh, what, do you do, what do you need to do to confirm it? What test you want to do for storage pool disease? To confirm it. You have to do a nucleotide assay for alpha granules and dense body granules, and you have to do electron microscopy to see is the granules there or not, and which one is not there, okay? Uh, now, this patient has no aggregation with risocetine, and this is 1.5, and when we add uh, uh, risocetine plus 0.5, there is some aggregation. And you can see here the whole tracing here. Ristocetine, 0.5, and then when we add the ristocetine, 1.5, no aggregation. Now here, you got the ADP is slightly aggregated. Uh, and when we put higher concentration of ADP, it becomes aggregation. What do you think the diagnosis is? Now, this is 
Uh, yeah, this is uh, Bernard Schiller syndrome. I'll repeat it again. Oh. <clears throat> I think a lot of we need don't, we don't need more platelet. I'll show you something else before I stop. Okay, what do you expect this blood film is? It's blood film and bone marrow. But uh, I want you to show, tell me what is from the blood film. This is an old man, more than 70 years old, with high white cell count, and he had abnormal platelet aggregation. Actually, he got PT-12, PTT-95, and fibrinogen 3.1. And this is the bone marrow. Okay? There is abnormal platelet aggregation, like ristocetin is abnormal. Ristocetin is abnormal. With this blood film and bone marrow. This is Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. You can see the blood film. Plasma cytoid, lymphoma, lymphoplasma cytoid, uh, lymphocyte, as you can see here. And the bone marrow showed many of these cells. Okay, so Waldenstrom macroglobinemia can give you acquired von Willebrand disease. I think I have another one and I will stop, hopefully. Right. What the blood film showed? This uh, actually uh, a blood film from a patient with a bleeding tendency. I'll give you the history. A 56 years old woman found to be unconscious by her husband. And these are the tests which is done, coagulation test which was done and she has Purpura and bleeding as well. Uh, the PT, PTT are normal. Fibrinogen is normal. Thrombin time is 14 seconds, normal again. Hemoglobin low, platelet 23 only. And the white cell 11.2. LDH extremely high. And serum creatinine is high. And I showed you the blood film. What is it? I'm sure it is clear. This is TTP, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Uh, what test you will do to confirm it? What is called ADAMS-13, all right? So uh, ADAMS-13 was done on this and uh, it showed low level. Uh, you can see Adams 13 here is less than 5% on the patient and the normal is, uh, as you can see, the normal is uh, to 6 to 126 and uh, 66, 100 to 126 and IgG anti Adams 13 is 85 and the normal is less than 4.2. In fact, this patient got anti-Adams antibodies, which is causing the depression 
of Adam's 30. All right, this one, what is this? Last one, last one, don't worry. <laughs> okay, what are these shells? Abnormal promylocytes, right? And to show it to you clear, this is a promylocyte, abnormal. What is there? There is our rose. Okay. What do you get in acute promyelocytic leukemia? You get a bleeding tendency. Now, what is the cause of bleeding in acute promyelocytic leukemia? Besides thrombocytopenia, of course. Yeah. It will induce what? DIC, right? So thrombocytopenia DIC. Why do you get DIC in acute promyelocytic leukemia? Hmm? It's the release of certain substances from promyelocyte, which cause the activation of coagulation, and then you get uh, the fibrin uh, the reduction in the fibrinogen abnormal PT and PTT, plus abnormal platelet, all these cause thrombocytopenia, and this is one of the dangerous, uh, cause uh, bleeding, and this is one of the dangerous types of acute leukemia which require emergency treatment. I will stop, and thank you for listening to me for exceeding my time, right? Thank you, Dr. Jha.